Our final event for the day will focus on leveraging WPS to enhance force resilience and readiness. I'm pleased to welcome our next moderator, a War College professor, Dr. Heidi Lane. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Uh, welcome back, everybody, for the last session of the day. Uh, it's my great pleasure to moderate this session uh, and introduce Honorable Coffey. Um, WPS, as you may be discovering or already knew, is not the same as DEI or gender equity, but it is related in the sense that it sets forth concrete pathways for institutional, legal, cultural, political, and economic change. In all senses, it creates a precedent and a platform for further action. In a nutshell, WPS really epitomizes what we're calling here smart power. Um, so it's my pleasure then to introduce Honorable uh, Sean Coffey, who is serving cu currently as the 24th General Counsel of the Department of the Navy. As General Counsel, he is the Navy's Chief Legal Officer and Head of the Office of the General Counsel, where he leads 1,100 attorneys and professional support staff in 140 offices across the world. He's a graduate of Georgetown University, as well as the Naval Academy, and has served uh, more than 18 years in the Naval Reserves, as well as eight years on uh, active duty. In sum, Honorable, Co uh, Honorable Coffey has spent the majority of his adult life as a public servant in different areas of national security. So it's my great pleasure to welcome him to the stage to discuss another aspect of that uh, domain. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm a lawyer and I'm here to help you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lane. Uh, good afternoon. I, I'm just so happy to be here at the 10th annual WPS symposium. Thank you, Dr. Yamin. Thank you, uh, Admiral Garvin, uh, for putting together such a terrific program. Uh, I certainly have learned a lot today. I have to concede that the word bride pricing was not in my national security field of view until this morning, and now it is. Uh, so uh, my thanks to uh, those who put together the robust agenda devoted to WPS. And my thanks to each of you who are attending both here physically and virtually uh, for devoting your uh, time and your energy and your thinking to this critically important effort. Uh, I am pleased to have the opportunity to share with you some thoughts broadly about the role of WPS in our efforts at the Department of the Navy. And I do want to bring up uh, a related topic, bring you up to date uh, on what we've been doing in the Department of the Navy to address uh, the scourge of sexual misconduct in the department. Uh, misconduct that is not only morally reprehensible and wrong, but also undermines readiness and ultimately our national security. Uh, put starkly, the positives that uh, WPS can offer to our national security cannot be fully realized if our force is not a safe, respectful, and supportive community for all of our sailors, Marines, and civilians. Now, this symposium is designed to strengthen your critical thinking and expand your strategic mindset through the lens of WPS. Uh, by now in the program, if you're like me, you recognize that recognizing the role of women is not simply a matter of equity, it is a matter of strategic importance. Uh, as you all know from uh, what we've heard today and from your preparation, uh, WPS began uh, in earnest with the uh, unanimous uh, UN Resolution 1325 in the year 2000, uh, which uh, was adopted in recognition of the crucial women in conflict, the crucial, the crucial role of women in conflict prevention, resolution, and peace building, and to emphasize that no nation can afford to ignore half its population. Our nation's commitment to WPS was codified in the statute of that name in 2017 and amended in 2021, and the Department of Defense is moving out to implement the WPS program. Much of what you read about women, peace, and security speaks to the desired end state of women's participation in peace processes, the unique security risks faced by women and girls in conflict-affected areas, 
and empowering leaders to become champions for equality and women's rights. While these ideals are critical to operationalizing WPS and to understanding its end state, allow me to discuss women, peace, and security from a strategic perspective and identify benefits for you soon to be strategists, senior leaders of warfighters, planners, and operators. As you know, the national security strategy of the United States is a broad whole of government strategy issued by President Biden and is rooted in our key national interest, quote, to protect the security of the American people, to expand economic prosperity and opportunity, and to realize and defend the democratic values at the heart of the American way of life, unquote. Supporting the national security strategy is the national military strategy promulgated by Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Within the Department of the Navy, our approach to the national military strategy has been framed by Secretary of the Navy Carlos del Toro through his three enduring priorities, strengthening maritime dominance, building a culture of warfighting excellence, and enhancing strategic partnerships. Each of these pr principles benefits from the applications of WPS, and in particular, the WPS principle that empowering women in the decision-making process can lead to better, more intelligent decisions. And I want to talk about intelligence for a few minutes. I want to pivot to what scientists refer to as collective intelligence. The observation that groups of individuals often act collectively in ways that seem intelligent. Our own experiences show us that intelligence arises not only in individual brains, it can also be seen on P3 crews, fire teams, platoons, working groups, and committees. We already know that expanding diversity within a group promotes viewing a problem from increased angles and perspectives, often leading to better solutions. I know that from my personal experience as a mission commander aboard a P3 Orion sub hunter, as commanding officer of a reserve P3 squadron, as a federal prosecutor spearheading complex uh, federal investigations, and as general counsel of the Navy, yes, I know that. In each of those instances, I was in charge, but I learned that if I sought the views of others, I was much more likely to reach a better decision. What we've witnessed ourselves regarding diversity is borne out in research, and especially so when that diversity includes women. Abundant academic research informs us that both problem solving and decision making are improved by including women in the process. Assuming, of course, they're allowed to participate and be heard. And drawing again on my own experience, uh, after two plus years as Navy General Counsel, I see that as absolutely true. Of the two dozen or so members of my senior executive steering group that leads the Office of General Counsel, over half are women. And they are integral to our problem solving and decision making. I see a direct line between that and the outstanding performance and reputation of the Office of General Counsel that I am privileged to lead. In preparing for my visit today, I did spend some time digging into the research and it is fascinating. In some, research shows that team collaboration is greatly improved by the presence of women on the team. The Harvard Business Review had an article in 2011 with the not so subtle title, quote, what makes a team smarter, more women, unquote. To my surprise, the researchers there found little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of the individual members. But if a group included more women, the data showed its collective intelligence was higher. More recently, the National Academy of Sciences published a pa paper that analyzed a wealth of data on group dynamics and performance, drawing from 22 studies, including thousands of individuals in over 1,300 different groups. The results support the conclusion that a group's ability to work together across a diverse set of tasks is enhanced by a ro robust collective intelligence factor and that the extent of corrective, collective intelligence is predicted by the proportion of women in the group. My simple takeaway from the research, more women, better decisions. 
So you see, we can view WPS as a problem-solving program, including, and may I say, especially including, how we solve problems relating to national security. WPS will improve your organizational problem solving and will be a catalyst for better decision making on matters of vital importance to strengthening maritime dominance, to building a culture of warfighting excellence, and to enhancing strategic partnerships. Within the Department of the Navy, the Secretary of the Navy, the CNO, and the Commandant have directed that women will have meaningful participation, that we will incorporate WPS principles and gender perspectives into doctrine, planning, and exercises, and that we will train personnel, such as many of you here present today, to implement WPS principles and gender perspectives. Our combatant commanders are already employing full-time WPS trainers and planners in their respective exercises and operations. For example, US Indo-PACOM has a travel team visiting allies and partners, instructing them on the benefits of WPS and what to expect. I note that in her letter to the, the symposium, CNO Franchetti stated, quote, our commitment to harnessing the power of every sailor and getting all hands on deck is not merely a reflection of our values, it is a strategic imperative for the success of our mission, unquote. I must also note that thanks to CNO Lisa Franchetti, the collective intelligence of that group known as the Joint Chiefs of Staff will, for the first time in history, benefit from the participation of a woman at the table. Now, while WPS represents a long overdue effort to give full voice and participation to our female shipmates, the fact remains that we have much work to do within the Department of the Navy to make it a self, uh, safe, respectful, and supportive community for our female shipmates. I cannot come to the Naval War College and speak to this forum as the Chief Legal Officer of the Department of the Navy and not address the fact that we have historically failed to provide that kind of environment for women. The incidence of sexual assault and sexual harassment in the Department of the Navy remains unacceptably high. It is not only morally wrong, it is a serious threat to readiness, recruiting, and retention. And it is the antithesis of how shipmates should care for each other in an environment where lives are dependent on mutual respect and support. We must fix this pronto. I can assure you that the civilian and uniformed leadership of the department is steadfastly committed to fixing this. And I'm seeing that firsthand, together with the Navy Judge Advocate General, Vice, Ad uh, Vice Admiral Crandall, the Staff Judge Advocate to the Commandant of the Marine Corps, Major General Bly, uh, and I, and, uh, and other senior leaders. Uh, I have served for the past two years on the DON's Implementation Advisory Panel, or IAP, a team established by the Secretary to propose how we can expeditiously and effectively put in place the historic changes to the military justice system prescribed by Congress and by the Independent Review Commission on Sexual Assault in the Military, or the IRC. The IAP on which I sit uh, currently meets every two weeks. We started by meeting every week about two years ago. And unless I am on travel, like I am today, uh, I uh, participate personally and actively in every single one. I'm missing today's, unfortunately. Uh, because this issue is personal for me. In the 1990s, I served as a commanding officer of a P3 squad, and I was still suffering the lingering consequences of sexual misconduct by a senior leader several years earlier. I saw firsthand how corrosive the misconduct was on the hangar deck, in the chief's mess, and in the wardroom. So when I returned to the Navy over 20 years later as general counsel, I was frankly appalled to see that this scourge has not meaningfully improved. We have not done enough. And I'm determined uh, to do my part to fix it. While military justice is in the JAG lane and not in the OGC lane, as the senior um, uh, legal officer for the department, 
Uh, I have uh, gotten quite involved in it and I'm grateful to uh, Admiral Crandall and General Bly for, for welcoming me, me into this uh, as a former commanding officer and as a former federal prosecutor. Um, I have a broad range, a range of legal uh, oversight uh, from acquisition to sensitive activities to fiscal law and everything in between, but doing my level best to sharply reduce the level of sexual misconduct in the Department of the Navy, military and civilian, is my top priority. Because if we cannot get to the right place with how we treat our shipmates, everything else we do is in jeopardy. I am pleased to report to you that as a department, we are getting after this issue aggressively. As of December 2023, we have in place offices of special trial counsel for both the Navy and the Marine Corps, each led by an 07. We have greatly increased the financial resources dedicated to victim support. We have established a no wrong door policy to ensure that victims are quickly put in touch with appropriate support services. Uh, with sexual harassment established as a precursor to sexual assault in many, many cases, uh, Secretary Del Toro made, in my view, the bold, bold and expensive decision to designate the Naval Criminal Investigative Service as the agency to investigate sexual harassment cases, thereby ensuring that we have our very finest investigators tackling this issue. And then he did the extraordinary things. Not only did he declare it, he actually funded it. And uh, NCIS has been funded to hire 225 special investigators dedicated exclusively to investigating sexual harassment in the fleet and the force, and has already onboarded 150 of them. I wanna give you an, uh, another example of, of the creative way that we're thinking about this. I think it's, it's pretty well established that when Congress was thinking about changing the military justice system, there was resistance from the military. We had done it this way for many, many years where the commanders had a decision on whether to charge or not. Uh, Congress spoke, and I can tell you from watching, uh, the military has saluted smartly and, and stepped out to execute as best they can. We put, they put a lot of time and effort into this and a lot of creative thinking. So I'll give you one example. Out in 29 Palms, the Marine Corps decided to try, uh, try things a little differently. Typically, if there's a sexual, misconduct, sexual assault allegation, the NCIS gets involved they will, they will investigate and on average to get to a written report takes about four, three or four months. And then it's handed off to uh, the prosecuting office which will then evaluate whether to move forward or recommend to, to the command to move forward, uh, at least that's before the OSTC. That would often result in victims not meeting the prosecutor for many months. Uh, and quite often the, the case would be presented and the prosecutors would say, this is too weak a case to move forward. Well, what, what uh, is, they did in uh, 29 Palms is they pulled forward the involvement of the, the uh, staff judge advocate. So rather than do it in series, NCIS, then prosecutor, you'd have the prosecutor embed with the, um, with the uh, NCIS. And we went from an average time between uh, allegation and first contact between the victim and the prosecutor of 128 days to four days. And we also got to know a lot quicker. Uh, a prosecutor would, prosecutor would evaluate the case and they would know within a, a couple of weeks, you know, this is gonna be a, a too thin a case to take to trial. And they would say no. That would, that would um, uh, make some of the victims unhappy but talking to victims' advocates, uh, the feedback was they, at least they knew sooner rather than four or five or six months out. And it freed up uh, resources to look at more serious cases. Uh, there was a paper written about this. It got a lot of attention in the Pentagon and other parts of our enterprise are looking seriously at that uh, creative solution. The Department of the Navy's overarching goals are to reduce the prevalence of sexual assault and sexual harassment, increase help-seeking behavior, and importantly, uh, restore trust in the military justice system. I am confident that we have put in place the means to get to a better place. 
Now to bring this back to WPS, women cannot contribute to their fullest potential in advancing our national security if they have concerns about their physical and emotional safety. So in my mind, as the department's chief legal officer, eradicating sexual misconduct advances national security. In closing, I wanna thank each of you for raising your hand to advance the cause of WPS. I challenge each of you to equip yourselves with the knowledge, skills, and perspectives necessary to incorporate WPS into doctrine, training, planning, operations, and decision making. This will require awareness and commitment, but we need it. We are counting on you to assist with this strategic imperative, to use CNO's words, and to return to the fleet and fleet marine force and help prepare sailors and Marines to learn, display, act, and implement WPS. The data suggests that our leaders who follow through on this will outperform those who do not. When our forces visit and train allies and partners, the sailors and Marines you have trained and will train will be expected to serve as examples. This, of course, means there is even more work to do prior to each deployment. And I was a former commanding officer of a squad and I appreciate how more training requirements continue to fill our fixed at home cycles. But the result is that your units are to be better trained and more ready. I encourage you not to view WPS training as another administrative box to check. Rather, commit to it as a readiness requirement and benefit. Women, peace, and security will heighten your organization's warfighting performance. With it, you will lead a better ship or squadron or wing or regiment. You can expect to reap the benefit of WPS with improved decision making and more creative and nimble problem solving. Embracing WPS will make you a better leader and, on, and our naval forces even more formidable. It is a noble and critical effort. I applaud your willingness to advance that effort. Hey folks, thank you so much for your kind attention. I mean, really, thank you for what you're doing on WPS. Uh, and uh, good luck as you get back to the fleet and the force and for you folks visiting, visiting internationally back to your, uh, your country. I don't know you, I learned a ton today and I'm very grateful to have been here. So thank you all very much. Thank you.